And the first speaker would be Professor Alan Franklin from Colorado University, University of Colorado, and he's, he's going to talk about uh, the prehistory of uh, the neutrino. I'd like to thank the organizers, Daniel and Michelle, for inviting me. I am not a contributor to neutrino physics. I'd also like to thank the European Physical Journal, particularly Section H, for sponsoring this talk. What I plan to do here is to discuss some of the experiments and the experimental results that led to Pauli's desperate solution, as he put it, to the problem posed by the continuous energy spectrum in beta decay for the conservation laws of energy and momentum. He proposed that in the nu atomic nucleus, there was a th another particle besides electrons and protons, which was very light, neutral, and had spin a half. And how that came to be is a 30-year story, which includes mistakes, wrong turns, and is not a history of unbroken success. The story begins with the discovery of radioactivity by Becquerel. This story is well known. He was engaging in the family business of phosphorescence, which both his father and his grandfather had done, the delayed emission of light by minerals when exposed to light. And his idea was to see if the exposure to bright sunlight would produce the new, then newly discovered Rentgen or X-rays. Unfortunately, the weather wasn't good, and the story, and it seems to be true, was he put the photographic plate in a drawer and put the uranium salt on top of it, and then some days later when the sun came out, he took the plate out and developed it and saw this black blob that there was something that was exposing the photographic plate. And after a series of experiments over six weeks, he found that uranium was emitting something that would expose a plate through the dark, heavy dark paper that he had covered the photographic plate in. In 1899, Ernest Rutherford f divided the, the radiation into two types. This is a graph that I made of Rutherford's results. There is one component that is absorbed very quickly. This is the number of aluminum foils. The first few foils get rid of th the first radiation but the second type goes on for quite a long time, and he gave them the mundane names of alpha and beta. In 1900, Paul Villard found a third type, gamma rays, which were neutral. The alphas were positive. The betas were negative. And in the early 1900s, both Becquerel and Kaufman showed that the beta particles were, had the same charge as Thomson's negative corpuscles, not yet the electron. And Kaufman and Becquerel found also that the beta particles emitted by radium actually showed continuous energy spectrum but nobody worried very much about it. They thought that one, the sources were not pure sources, and two, that the electrons were losing energy as they got out of the source. In 1904, William Bragg, the elder, showed that the alpha particles had a finite range in matter, and that they argued that they were monoenergetic. This is Bragg's data. It's a very odd graph. Here we have the amount of ionization going up here, and this is the distance. So 
the ionization goes down as the distance goes up, and there are three breaks, two breaks in each curve, which he associated with alpha particles of different energies. He also argued that if the absorption or the removal from the beam of particles had a constant cross-section as it passed through matter, that if they were monoenergetic, they would exhibit exponential absorption. And this was the work that Schmidt and Hahn, Meitner and von Baer found in Germany. This is Schmidt's work in 1906. He has radium C, which again shows us two straight lines. This is the log of the intensity, again in radium B, and he associated this with two monoenergetic groups of electrons. This is the work of Hahn, Meitner, and von Baer, and you see this is roughly a straight line. Again, logarithm showing the exponential absorption, and they assumed that that showed that the electrons were monoenergetic. In 1909, William Wilson, who doesn't get mentioned much, showed that the emperor and the empress had no clothes. He demonstrated that, in fact, the absorption of monoenergetic electrons from beta decay was not, in fact, exponential, but was, in fact, linear. Here is Williams. He d used two different apparatuses, bending them in a magnetic field and restricting the radius of curvature so he could determine the energy. He then plotted the absorption as a function of energy. This is his second one. The first one used radium bromide, the second radon, and the detector, detector was an electroscope. And here's, Wilson was a young student working with Rutherford in Manchester, and here's his result. And it's quite clear that it's, except for something toward the end, it's linear absorption not exponential. Here's, if you plot the log, that is not a straight line as it would be for exponential absorption. Now, Wilson, by the way, Wilson's paper is, to my mind, a masterpiece of experimental exposition. He does virtually everything right. He worried that he was disagreeing with Meitner, Hahn, von Baer, and Schmidt all well-known physicists, and so he worried about why he was getting a disagreement, and he no, argued that the reason he disagreed with them was that they were not, in fact, investigating monoenergetic electrons. What he showed was that if you had a range of energies, and if the low energy electrons were preferentially absorbed and the electrons lost energy in passing through matter that you would in fact get exponential absorption. This is Wilson's calculation from his 1909 paper. This is the logarithm which is a very nice straight line. Here's the exponential curve. Now, I won't go into history, it gets very complicated as to how Wilson's results get accepted over the next few years, but certainly Meitner, Hahn, and von Baer re realize that they, he has shown something. There was, however, a problem for Wilson. Schmidt had shown that electrons don't lose energy in passing through matter. You laugh, but that's what he, here's his experimental apparatus. 
You have a radioactive source, again, a restricted radius of curvature with a magnetic field perpendicular to the plane. And what he did was to measure the magnetic field at which he got maximum ionization. And he then put an absorber just here, did the same experiment, and found, in fact, that the field at which he got maximum ionization was the same. Now, Wilson knew this, and he showed why Schmidt's result was correct, but had been misinterpreted, just as the Hahn Meitner. What Wilson showed was here curves A, B, and C are taken with the absorber just under the electroscope. And you'll notice that the peak shifts to the right because the lower energy electrons are preferentially absorbed. He then put the absorber not under the electroscope, but just before the source, and the electrons lose energy, and the peak moves back to roughly the same place. There were two confounding effects that canceled each other out, and Wilson noted this, says this experiment explains why the experiments of Schmidt apparently show no change in the velocity of the rays. According to the views expressed here, he was dealing with heterogeneous rays and the positions of the maximum should therefore move to higher fields if the velocity of the rays does not change. The actual decrease in velocity brings the maximum back to the same. So he showed, once again, that Schmidt's results were right. He had just misinterpreted them. Hahn, Meitner, and von Baer realized that they had to change their experimental apparatus, not just absorption. They incorporated a magnetic field. And, oh, here's Wilson's later experiment. He actually made the beam, a monoenergetic beam, heterogeneous by putting it through an absorber and he finds exponential absorption going. <laughs> Wilson's results were great, but. <laughs> and here's Hahn and Meitner's new apparatus. They start with a radioactive source. They find, again, a magnetic field perpendicular, a small slit here, and so for the set, for, electrons with the same momentum, they would appear at different points on the photographic plate. And here is their first result. Not, here's a line and here's part of a line showing monoenergetic. And they formulated the nice hypothesis that for each element beta decaying, there would be one group of homogeneous electrons. Unfortunately, they improved their apparatus and their techniques, and this is their result. They got line after line, and also a sm uh, smooth background underneath it, and realized that the idea of a single group of electrons with the same energy for each element was just untenable. Hahn wrote about this. In 1914, Chadwick, who is v working in Berlin with Geiger, publishes the following result. A continuous energy spectrum with a few peaks, that's internal conversion or OJ electrons, as we now know. The curve is, curves are obtained. Curve B is with an ionization chamber. Curve A is with the newly invented Geiger counters. And he publishes this, and nothing much happens. This is 1914. A major event occurs, namely World War I, which slows down work enormously. And Chadwick, who is an enemy alien working in Germany, gets interned in the Ruhleben internment camp. 
and it's a very different kind of internment camp than we have perhaps today. He was allowed to continue doing experiments and he enlisted the help of a young man, Charles Ellis, who was studying his to be, have a career in the Royal Engineers. And Ellis, who has a major role to play in our story, was so pleased with doing physics that he gave up his ambition to be a Royal Engineer and went back after the war to study with Chadwick and become a physicist. Okay, after the war, Meitner poses some difficulties for this continuous spectrum. She says, if the nucleus is a quantum system, the, and the, then the beta decay coming off would be a transition from one state to the other and should be monoenergetic. And she poses, points out three possible mechanisms for energy loss. These include the Compton effect, the scattering of gamma rays off electrons, lower, changing the energy of the electron, Bremsstrahlung, where the electron loses energy, or electron scattering. And she also said that, hey, nobody had ever reproduced Chadwick's results. So in 1923, Chadwick and Ellis replicate Chadwick's original results, getting the same result. They also note that Meitner's mechanisms do not work. That radium E, bismuth 210, does not produce any gamma rays, so that re removes the idea of Compton scattering or Bremsstrahlung, and also electron scattering uh, would produce two electrons per beta decay, and Mosley had already shown, this was before he was killed at Gallipoli, that beta decay produced only one electron per decay. So they concluded that in fact, here's Chadwick writing, by the way, to Rutherford saying, I get photographs, but with a counter I can't find anything. Here's Ellis and Worcester. They are left with the conclusion that the disintegration energy from the nucleus is at varying velocity. That they had no idea as to how to explain this. And one thing they said was, well, we could say energy conservation <laughs> doesn't work. <clears throat> but they say, but an explanation of this type would only be justified when everything else had failed, although it may be kept in mind as an ultimate possibility. We think it best to disregard it at the moment. But they also pointed out that you could, in fact, find out how, whether or not the spectrum was continuous. What you needed to do, and you used, they used radium E because it produces no gamma rays and you can only measure. If you measure the average energy of the electron and it is a continuous spectrum, you would get the average energy as shown in the spectrum that you find with ionization. If it was losing energy by some process or other, which they did not know, then they would, the average energy would be the maximum energy. Here's the spectrum. If the if spectrum is continuous, you would get a max, an average energy of, oh, 350 kilovolts. If not, it would be virtually a megavolt. And they said, this is a measurement we can do. We can measure the average energy. There was, however, a problem, given the technology available at the time. They were faced with what 
you might call catch-22. If you measured the average energy, the total energy, as they were suggesting, you couldn't count the number of electrons and you couldn't get the average energy. If you counted the number of electrons, you couldn't be sure that you were measuring all of the energy. They were going to use a total absorption calorimeter. But fortunately, there was a background that enabled them to solve the problem. When radium E bismuth 210 uh, decays, it produces polonium, which also decays. It decays by alpha emission. And what you then get is a curve here. The total energy is, here's the polonium energy produced, increasing as the, and here's the difference is the energy produced by the beta decay of radium E. And if it's due to the, radio, the beta decay, it should fit the lifetime, which it does. Fits 5.1 days very nicely. But how did they get the energy? If you look at it, this is enormously clever. The ratio of the heating effect to radium E to the heating effect of polonium at any given time is this expression, where X is the ratio of the energy of a polonium decay to the average energy of a radium E decay. Now, polonium is an alpha emitter. You can measure its decay exactly. It's a, alphas have a monoenergetic spectrum. And so the polonium was known and so at any given time, they could in fact measure X and get the average energy. And here's their results. This is for, you'll see here that they get 339,000 volts, 340, 350. Their average is around 350 kilovolts, which is clearly not the maximum energy. They did it also with different sources of different strengths, again, getting roughly the same answer. Meitner and Othman reproduced the experiment. This is 1927 by Ellis and Worcester. 1930, Meitner and Othman reproduced the experiment. Ellis and Worcester conclude that it has to be continuous. Meitner writes to Ellis, and they had had a fairly nasty correspondence up till then, saying, we have verified your results completely. It seems to me now there can be no doubt that you were completely correct in assuming that beta radiations are primarily inhomogeneous, but I do not understand the result at all. <clears throat> Neither did almost anybody else. Recall that beta decay was thought to be a two-body process. Nucleus decays to an electron and a daughter nucleus. Conservation of energy and momentum require a single energy for the electron. There were two alternatives proposed. The first was to give up conservation of energy. And I was surprised to find how many people, including some very good physicists, were willing to give up conservation of energy. Here's a letter from Albert Einstein in 1910. It says, I have high hopes for solving the radiation problem without light quanta, but I have to renounce the energy principle. C.G. Darwin, in an unpublished manuscript, talks about giving up the idea of conservation of energy. Bohr, Kramers, and Slater in this famous 1924 paper on the quantum theory of radiation give up conservation of energy. And Bohr actually was willing to do that fairly regularly. 
Uh, G.P. Thompson said, well, if you do that, you leave the fascinating paths traced by mathematicians among the quicksands of metaphysics. And certainly nobody wants to do that. And there was the other alternative, <coughs> namely his bore in 1932. He's still hanging on. He says, we don't know enough about quantum systems to say energy is conserved. And finally, Pauli writes his famous letter in 1931 to his fellow radioactive <coughs> ladies and gentlemen who are attending a conference. He is attending a ball, said his attendance was required at the ball. And he proposes the idea of a neutral light spin a half particle. It solves the conservation of energy and momentum problems. It does not, it solves also the problem of nuclear spins. The problem for nitrogen 14, for example, was if nitrogen 14 had 14 protons and seven electrons, which it had to have, it had to have half integral spin but it was known to have spin one. If you add the neutri seven neutrinos, you, get, uh, you can allow spin one. And it doesn't solve all the problems of the nuclear model of the atom, but it solved two of them and that the other problems get solved later and I will Leave that for later speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. So we can open the, the question session. So please give your name and affiliation. Hi, Stacy. I'm just wondering, wasn't that letter to these uh, radioactive Freunde uh, 1930? I saw it in, uh, Peist says 1931, but. Okay. okay one question here. Please give your I'm Sasha Kopp. I was hoping you could put back the quote from Einstein because he says you can't solve the energy problem without re resorting to light quanta. Does he, in some sense, does he presage the idea of a neutrino in this? I don't think so. Uh, there, there was a question about Millikan, for example, was never happy with the idea of photons and quanta. And he said that Einstein himself wasn't, had given it up. And I was shocked when I read Millikan saying that. But people at the Einstein Papers Project sent me this quote. And so he was willing to give up the photon at one, uh, this is only in a letter. He never, as far as I know, published it. But he certainly considered it as a possibility. At least that's what the Einstein papers people. Michel Cribier, Saclay, here. You quote a, a letter, if I remember, from 1932, so after Pauli's idea from Bohr. So yeah, it's a lecture he gave at the British, I think, Chemical Society. But, uh, but does it mean that Bohr was not aware ab about this hypothesis, or he, he doesn't believe it uh, enough? Or? He is still willing to hold on to the idea that energy isn't conserved. Okay. You know, he, this is not the first time he gave it up. He gave it up in 1924 also. And actually, the history of energy, there are a whole set of experiments. I haven't talked about them. It takes until about 1936 with a whole set of other experiments which finally convince even Bohr uh, 
that energy is conserved in these processes. But it's again not a simple story. I mean, war is not dumb. So what you say is uh, Pauli's idea to propose this idea of neutrinos not has been a long time to be adopted by most of the people. I don't know when, I've never looked at when it finally does get accepted, but there are other problems that the neutrino does not solve. For example, if the, the nuclear, which only gets solved with, high, with the discovery of the neutron by Chadwick and Heisenberg's further theoretical work on the nucleus, but until then, you have the problem of the nuclear magnetic moment should be much, much larger. Remember, you have electrons in the nucleus, and it's EH bar over MC, and the M of the electron is 1,800 times. So the fine structure or the hyperfine structure should be much, much larger than it was measured to be. So that doesn't, so the neutrino doesn't solve all the problems. Also, there's a whole set of confusions about whose neutron, Pauli called it the neutron, and whose neutron are you talking about? And uh, there is a confusion in the literature. So I would like to point out that, uh, you know, uh, Rutherford, he nominated Barclay, Charles Barclay, for Nobel Prize. He had continued, Barclay is the person who did the work that, that yeah, huh? very, very important about the spectra of the uh, at atoms and so on. And then he, pra uh, he praised him for not believing in those photons. We British, we don't believe in that sort of thing, you know, that sort of nonsense. And actually, Pierre Weiss also nominated Einstein for, the, for several things, including Pierre Weiss was a, from Strasbourg. He was a very great scientist and a, something like maybe 14 years older than Albert Einstein in Zurich. A colleague of him, he said that he had conf Einstein had confided in him in his nomination, that it, the most difficult thing he ever did was the idea of photon, because he just couldn't be sure that it was, it was correct, you see? He was very worrying about that, about the photoelectric effect and things yeah, like uh, that. The and that, yeah, that's the what uh, happened, yeah, so. Yeah, there's Sorry. a famous letter from Planck nominating Einstein for the Prussian Academy of Sciences, where he says, well, you know, he's doing great work, and when you work at the frontiers, you're going to make mistakes sure. like the photon. Sure, sure. That's, that's absolutely true, yeah. And even Compton, whose work shows, really argues for the photon in 1923, in 1925, in a later paper by Compton and Simon, is still saying, you know, it's not clear that we've done it all. He actually does not only the energy change, but he measures the angle of recoil of the gamma ray to show that it fits the photon idea. And so that takes, uh, according to Roger Stewart, who knows more than I do about this, you don't really get the ex full acceptance of the photon till sometime around 1930, give or take a few years. Yeah. I think that also we make a very big mistake at the universities that we start with Maxwell's equations and then you try to make Maxwell's equations and get a photon out of it from electric fields and magnetic fields and things like that, which are really representing a huge number of photons. You see, they're not just describing a single photon. I've seen some books I won't mention because they're written by French people, very famous French people. I don't want to say anything against French people in a French auditorium. <laughs> so I'll tell you that actually it's really true. I mean, it's just a mistake. You have to start, you should really start with quantum electrodynamics. That's the only way and build up the Maxwell's equations out of quantum electrodynamics. I mean, you make a cathedral out of stones, but you don't say that, you know, the cathedral is the excitation of the, of the stone. You don't say that. But, so it's really the wrong way we are teaching electrodynamics nowadays. Well, well, I have a recent piece of work called Physics Textbooks Don't Always Tell the Truth. And it, one of the errors of omission is that I looked at 10, 
you know, an unscientific survey with no statistics. I can't get five sigma out of it. But only two even mention any experiments on the continuous energy spectrum, and only one, two out of 11, and only one mentions Ellis and Worcester. And so the guys who played such an important role here rarely get mentioned in physics textbooks. But then again, that's not their purpose. Doesn't work? Ah, works. Yeah, Christian Spiering, Daisy. Um, I, somebody said that why after Pauli's proposal people did not accept the hypothesis or for, lo for, much, for what a long time they did not. And <clears throat> I, I remember just one story, and my Russian colleagues can, uh, can correct me if I'm, I'm, I'm wrong with the times. Lev Landau, did, for a long time, did not believe uh, in the neutrino hypothesis. And uh, after having been arrested for an anti-Stalinistic letter, and after having been released from that, he still was accused to hold idealistic positions, which uh, was against what Friedrich Engels wrote, namely that uh, energy conservation is the iron law of physics. So uh, he, that, that, was, that was turned to a political or philosophical uh, question, and uh, he was heavily attacked for that. After having been released, for something uh, for which other people would have been shooting. Uh, my late colleague, George Gamov, wrote two books on radioactivity, which one, the first edition comes out before Pauli, the second after, and he is favorable to Pauli's neutrino, but not absolutely convinced. And there are experiments as early as around 1938 by Lipunsky arguing for the neutrino. And, but again, they're suggestive, but not totally convincing. Uh, Sasha Cobb from Stony Brook. Um, you mentioned that the neutrino didn't solve everything right away and that neut the neutron was important discovery in the 30s. To what extent was Curie's spectrum and, ba and uh, Fermi's uh, theory that could explain it, the Curie spectrum using the, the neutrino, uh, influential I, in? I am only dealing with the prehistory uh, here. I mean, Fermi's theory is, of course, hugely important. And, but that's the next speaker. And we have agreed that I would end at a certain point in time. Yeah. I'm not allowed to do everything, I mean. Uh, Juan Hernandez from Valencia. I have read uh, somewhere that Chadwick himself said, uh, when the problem was on the table, said that maybe some other radiation is coming out from beta decay, some other radiation that we cannot detect. Is that mm. true? Is, is that I, documented? I, I don't know. But, you know, people were suspecting that there were energy losses in ways that they didn't understand. So it's, he would not have been alone. Certainly, he, you know, people had been worrying about things that, that you just didn't understand enough about beta decay to make, exclude everything. Chadwick, uh, Ellis and Worcester, just kill it, saying that it has to be continuous. Until you get Ellis and Worcester, you have good arguments earlier by them and by others, but you have the possibility that we don't know everything. And I think that's actually a reasonably good attitude to take. Evgeny Ahmed of Heidelberg. Just a comment on what Christian said about Landau. As far as I know, Landau really didn't believe parity non conservation for a long time. He didn't like this idea. But I never heard him not believing in neutrino as an explanation of the continuous spectrum. Probably some confusion. Okay. I, mean, I have a question now. What was the idea of the composition of nuclei? Uh, in the 20s and uh, I mean... Protons and electrons. But I thought that 
there were protons and pairs of protons and electrons, not just protons. That and was an idea that Rutherford suggested, but you know, uh, he had an idea that there could be a very tightly bound state of electron and proton, but I don't think it ever penetrated the whole physics community. The major model was just protons and electrons. But how then could you explain the masses of the nuclei? I mean, you miss half of the mass if you don't have enough protons. No, no, they had for 14 protons, seven electrons for nitrogen, 14 or three protons, three electrons for lithium, six. There was no problem with the mass. The problem was <laughs> spin and, and in fact, in the letter, Pauli says, the first thing he says is, I've solved the spin statistics problem. So. So maybe we just have time for one question. Yeah, please. Just state your name again. Pierre Ramon, University of Florida. Um, since you, I think we're going to see this letter quite uh, many times over the next uh, few days. Um, there is, I think, that the, in that letter, the neutrino had to be massive. And the reason is because, right, it had, it had to have a magnetic moment in order to stay around the nucleus. Yeah, correct? He, sa correct? he says it is not traveling at the speed of light. He's very clear on that, that it, but that the mass has to be quite small. It's not a zero mass. That gets into all sorts of other difficulties. <laughs>